This September 7th, Mammoth is hosting the Mammoth Grand Fondo. It's located just outside of the entrance of the Yosemite National Park. The Mammoth Grand Fondo takes riders along the east side of the High Sierra with views of the Sierra Nevada Range, Mono Lake, and the White Mountains. It's got three different distance options, 102 miles, 70 miles, and 42 miles. For more information, check out mammothgrandfondo.com or visit them on Facebook at Mammoth Grand Fondo. Are you a cyclist in need of an attorney? Well, look no further because Benici Law Group is here to help. They have three full-time attorneys who deal specifically with bicycle accidents. They cover all types of cases, and not to mention, Josh Benici is not only a lawyer, but he's a cyclist himself. He's participated in the Belgian Waffle Ride as well as Leadville, and has sponsored teams such as the local SDBC team and the SD Velodrome. For more information, check out BeniciLawGroup.com or SDDisabilityAttorney.com. Welcome to the Villa Worthy Podcast. I'm your host, Brian Coe. And it seems like for the first time, we're actually in studio today. Uh, ever since we started season three, we've been on the move, on the road to different races, different events. Uh, I just got back from Spain recently, and we are going to talk about that trip today. But before we do that, we have a couple of quick announcements. First things first, I am so excited to finally be able to talk to you about the new VeloWorthy kits. Basically, what's going to happen is by the time you're listening, we're going to have our store up. And that store is a link both on my website and all my social medias to the kits. They're from LEL Cycling. And let me tell you, we worked so hard on these. I can't tell you how many different revisions we did. But we decided on doing a simple black and white kit with a little bit of a pattern in there and then just the Veloworthy logo, the LEL logo, and then we sort of went up in terms of design. So you have some options. You have options of bibs, which is our Laguna Seca bib, which is our super high-end uh, chamois bib. It's got like a really cool design on one of the leg bands and a very subtle VW logo on the left leg band. Uh, and then we have the jersey, and this is key because we decided to go with the Solana jersey. And if you go on the LEL website, lelcycling.com, you're able to see how good this specific jersey is. Number one, it's got sort of a longer sleeve length that seems to be the trend in some of the more modern kits. So that's one. The second thing that I like about it is it's got three pockets, but then it has on the back right rear pocket it's got a little zipper so you can stow away a key or a credit card or a driver's license it's not huge but it's just enough to make things secure because if you've been riding long enough you know if you you've hit a bump or you crash your things can sometimes fall out of your rear pocket so this is secure um, we also have a skin suit and that skin suit is full zip for, for, for those of you that like a more fitted arrow look, it is full zip with pockets in the back. It is their uh, streamlined skin suit. And then the best thing about it is it's our first ordering window. The window starts today. So you have today and then 10 days from now, which will close on July the 19th, 2019. And then once that store closes, the kits go into production. So like I said, I have the link posted on show notes. It'll be posted on my website as well as all the socials. And I will provide on my Instagram and Facebook uh, sort of the snapshots of the design so you get to look at it. I mean, I can only describe it for so much, but then you really need to see these. So it's through LEL. It's the Solana jersey. It's the Laguna uh, bib short. And then it's the it's the full zip suit which i'm so excited about and the best part is too the prices for this very first run we're going to close the window after 10 days i'm basically selling it to you at my cost plus like a couple extra bucks uh so you're not i'm not charging like a super high premium i mean these clothes are not cheap they're on par with any other cycling brand so it is one of those things that i've decided to go with lel for a lot of different reasons but the main one being the quality of the clothing and the design. So I am so excited to share that with you. So you have 10 days, 10 days to get to the website, order your size. It's got a great fit kit chart in there. If you've, if you've never tried LEL clothing, if you have, you know your size, go ahead and add that to cart and uh, we will bring those to you shortly. 
we have some great upcoming things. First of all, if you have a legal question when it comes to cycling, we're bringing back our much anticipated Ask a Lawyer segment with cyclist and lawyer Josh Benici. He is gonna be fielding questions directly from you onto uh, the next or future shows, I should say, in a sit down talk between myself and Josh Benici about all your legal questions. I mean, the, the, the one time you may need legal questions <laughs> answered, it's already too late because whether you're involved in a crash or you got a ticket or something of that matter, um, he is a lawyer. He's not your lawyer, so I wouldn't draw directly on his legal advice, but at the same time, he does provide a lot of information. So go ahead and send out your questions to brian at veloworthy.com. I'll forward those on to Josh. We'll sit down and maybe read one of your questions on the future Ask a Lawyer segments, but we did those in season two and they were fantastic. We got a lot of interesting questions and we talked about some really cutting edge stuff what to do in case of an accident what to do when you get pulled over what do you say to the cop even though if you were in the right a lot of times law enforcement doesn't know everything about bike law uh we talked about uh the new scooter phenomenon and i'm sure we've got some new topics as well i personally am, am interested in the e-bike phenomenon and how that works on trails and roads and, and things like that so uh Write in your questions, ask a lawyer with Josh Benici. Uh, that'll be coming up soon. And again, hit me up at brian at veloworthy.com. You can also hit me up at Instagram and DM me or on Facebook if you have an ask a lawyer question. Uh, I'm at veloworthy on Instagram and then veloworthy on Facebook as well. It is July, and that can only mean one thing in the cycling world. That, of course, is the Tour de France. And for this year's race, I'm a little bit more invested. Like I said, I just got back from a big, big training camp with the EF team in Spain and Andorra, which we'll get to. But uh, I usually like to start the beginning of the podcast with our Tour de France predictions. And by the time you're getting this, the riders have completed up to stage three uh, and they're probably just starting stage four. Uh, so the tour is still very, very young in the grand scheme of things. It's three weeks, the most important week being the last week, and that still leaves us time for our predictions. I'm going to go ahead and make my prediction, and I'll give sort of my wild card prediction. So my prediction to win the 2019 Tour de France is going to be none other than Egon Bernal of Team Enios for a couple reasons. He's a fantastic climber. He is mature beyond his years. Last year in the Tour de France, uh, he was in a support role, but was able to not only hang on the climbs, he was able to, uh, it didn't look like he was riding hard at all. There's not that many, there's only one time trial, not counting the team time trial they did, which they, Team Ineos got second in, but there's only one team time trial, and if he loses about not too much time, he should be able to make it up for in the mountains. So Egon Bernal, barring any crashes or uh, mechanicals or just, bad legs he's my pick for the win my wild card pick and i am biased towards team ef i just spent nine days with them in spain but i think tj van garderen is riding super well he's riding on a different level he is riding in a way that people have not seen and the way that he has trained in the past few days both in andorra and girona i think he's going to surprise a few people so tj van garderen plus he's an american and this year, the tour is kind of hurting for Americans. There's only four. T.J. Van Garderen, Chad Haga, Joey Roscoff, and I'm missing one. We have, a, we have a North American in Mike Woods. Oh, and then Ben King on Dimension Data. Those are the four Americans. It's We're kind of lacking in the numbers. I mean, we used to have upwards of 10, 11 during our peak. But the ones that we do have, they're contenders. Speaking of of TJ Van Garderen. He also has a strong teammate in Mike Woods. Um, it's his first tour to France. He's done other grand tours, but he can shine in the mountains. TJ is more of a support role for Rigoberto Uran, who got second in 2017, but I think he will surprise people uh, with either a stage win or he'll finish high up in the general, general classifications. But like I said, I'm sticking with my pick, Egon Bernal, for the win. We'll see in Paris if that comes true or not. Um, so far, I'm 0 for 
four or five. I didn't pick Garrett Thomas to win last year, so we'll see. Next up, we're bringing back a segment we haven't done for a long time, but I thought it was appropriate we bring it back. And that, of course, is listener feedback. For this segment, we are joined with none other than our previous co-host from Season 2, Adam Saba. How are you doing, Adam? I'm doing great. Thanks for joining us today in a in a hot, cramped studio. But uh, it is summer. It's July. Uh, what are your summer plans? Uh, well, I just got back from Europe last week. And uh, so my wife and my son are still there. Uh, they'll be there till the end of the month. So I'm a bachelor. So I'll be hanging out here a lot. Living the life. For the record, Adam is a non-cyclist. But I think that adds into the show because it's always good to have a non-cyclist perspective when it comes to the show. Uh, but Adam, we're going to start us off with a couple of different uh, areas of where people reached me. If you're interested in writing into the show, there's a number of different ways you can do it. The most common being brian at veloworthy.com. You can send in your emails. Uh, we're going to start off today, though, with uh, an iTunes review, which is super key. If you like this show, if you find it helpful, uh, if you want to see it sort of rank a little bit higher, there's a lot of podcasts out there. We really want to get our name out there. We would love a five-star review on iTunes. Adam, go ahead and take this one away uh, from iTunes. All right. This is from USMC Ryan C. Uh, great podcast for cycling fans, especially uh, if you're in, in SoCal. Great race coverage and awesome interviews. Plus, great discussion of, of other, I think bike, it's supposed to be biking-related topics of interest for riders at all levels. Love it. Great. Uh, I assume USMC means he's in the Marines. And as you know, in SoCal, where we're located, we're kind of in a military town. And it's always great to see uh, people on bikes from all walks of life. And so, yeah, we love it. And keep riding in. Thank you, USMC Ryan C., uh, hope we are uh, getting to you, whether you're here stateside or abroad, deployed, far off somewhere that this podcast can sort of remind you of home. We appreciate it. Uh, the next ones we're going to get to are uh, emails that were sent in. Again, Brian at Veloworthy. Adam, go ahead and take the first one. All right. This is from, uh, it doesn't have a name. It says, hi, Brian. Oh, this is from Ryan Clark. Ryan Clark from San Diego, yeah. I'm a big fan of the podcast. Love the tour of California Recap. My wife and I actually followed all of the stages in person, and we camped in our Subaru along the way. Highlights for me were camping at Laguna Seca Raceway and getting pushed by a duck up Baldy in Cookie Corner. It was really awesome to meet so many of the pros. I think we will try and do the same every year. Thanks for the podcast. All right. Thanks for writing in, Ryan. I think one of the things with cycling fans is it's an investment to go to a bike race and watch. It's not like it's a you can go to a stadium and buy tickets and sit down and grab a beer. A lot of times, at least for the, the mountain stages, you have to park, you have to hike up or ride your bike, get there, sit there, time it right because you don't know exactly when the riders are coming through and when they do yeah you see them for a couple of minutes on the climbs and for the flat stages maybe 10 seconds and they're gone <laughs> so it, so cycling does ask a lot of its fans uh that's pretty amazing that they were able to do all of the stages so it's this year it started in sacramento and then worked its way south it finished in pasadena so if they're in their subaru i'm imagining them you know camping along the different campsites and then in laguna seca that's in monterey uh it says they were getting pushed by a duck a baldy and cookie corner so i'll try and break this down uh mount baldy is the queen stage it finishes on a mountain top started in ontario and uh cookie corner is known as phil guyman's cookie corner so phil guyman is this retired pro that still goes out there and he's kind of big on youtube and he has his own grand fondo race and he's known as for smashing uh records on strava which is like the fitness tracking site and um he has this affinity for cookies that's like his signature thing and so he took over this corner of the stage called Cookie Corner. And as riders pass through, not the lead riders, but just everybody else, he'd have his legion of fans sort of run up next to the riders, handing out free cookies to the cyclists. And some of them were great. They grabbed cookies and did wheelies and uh, being 
in that corner with all the energy of the people is pretty amazing. So uh, I don't know what he means by duck, though. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, I really don't have a clue. But here's my question. So Ryan said he followed the race. So that's like the bicycling form of tailgating at, at a stadium kind that's of a, like you that's a good analogy that. yeah. that's a really good analogy because tailgating <laughs> at you know a football game you go hang out in the parking lot and eat chili and maybe play a game of cornhole but the, <laughs> <laughs> the ultimate tailgating yeah. is you able to follow the race pack up your stuff drive to the next city or town that the stage both starts and finishes since they're point to point they don't always finish in the same town unless it's like a time trial and this year there was none uh, and it's something and you're hanging that, out with the other people watching, right? right you're on hanging out with road, other yeah. people watching on the side of the road, sort of randomly. You just pick a random spot and, you know, get out your phone and take some pictures. So that's great, Ryan. Keep doing what you're doing. <laughs> Maybe you can upgrade to the Tour de France and follow that for 21 stages because that is the ultimate fan experience. All right, what's next? Okay, another e- listener email. This is from Juan. Uh, I'm following up and sending you the email we talked about on Instagram. Thank you for answering back and for any help. My name is Juan and I'm moving to San Diego next month. As I told you, I'm a fairly competitive cyclist where cyclocross is my main discipline, but I know uh, that it is a little sparse down there. I'm basically interested in knowing where I can find good sources of information about races, rides, good bike shops in the city, maybe best coffee shops for cyclists. Uh, I'm also curious to know... uh, to know if, as I have been, as if I have been around, most of the crits and stuff like that are in the LA area. I know it's a really general set of questions, but any leads will help. Again, thank you, Juan. Juan, you must be fast because your last name is Bernal, and your relation to. You. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Uh, okay, so first of all, thanks for writing in. That's a huge question. Welcome to SoCal. Uh, by the time you're probably hearing this, you're already in San Diego which is great. So let's sort of go over your questions one by one. Number one, it's great that you're a cyclocrosser. We need more cyclocross people in SoCal. Uh, Unfortunately, the races here, like you said, are a little sparse. You're going to have to commute to LA to get to any of the bigger cyclocross races. It's about a two hour drive, depending on what time your race is. You have to kind of you know, welcome to SoCal. You have to do the math on the traffic. You have to figure when you're going to hit the 405 and the five and take ways. You're going to be on a million different streets, but there are some great races there and really competitive cyclists from the LA and Orange County areas. So do not miss out from them. Uh, but if you want to find good sources of information about races, rides, there's a couple different sites out there. There's SoCalCycling.com that talks about some different group rides. There's a lot of bike shops in SoCal. If I were you, I would hit the coast. So go on Coast Highway and there's a bunch of different bike shops. Personally, I've been to Nitro. I used to work at that shop. That's in Encinitas. There's a Revolution Bike Shop in Solana Beach. Um, Those are sort of really good hubs for finding out great information. Uh, Gone are the days where you just stroll into the shop and be like, Hey, I'm new in town. Show me around. I mean, people will still do that, but what they have online, uh, you can find some great, great resources out there. USA cycling too. You know, if you put in the region, it will explain to you, uh, some of the areas, things like that, that have the races. Uh, you also said coffee shops. Let me tell you something. Coffee shops and cyclists go hand in hand. They are an amazing duo. And a lot of the group rides in San Diego, the Saturday ride, the Sunday ride, there's also a Tuesday, Thursday morning ride. Um, The Saturday and Sunday rides leave from various coffee shops. There's one called Lofty. There's a revolution in the morning for Swami's ride, which leaves on Saturdays. They have free coffee there for the riders. And then um, I would say find those ride with people and just start talking to them. They'll, I mean, if you're from out of town, they'll talk to you, especially if you're like, Hey, I'm new. I want to know the routes. There's pretty much a group ride for every single day of the week. Uh, but yeah, talk to those people and you'll find them. And then the, your last point, um, you said you have seen around most of the crits and stuff like that in the LA area. LA has the CBR series. Uh, it just wrapped up its series. CBR stands for California Bicycle Racing. It's a great series that has groomed some amazing talent. 
Uh, there's a weekly series. There's uh, a lot of different resources that you can find both through USA Cycling and then also just your local group rides. LA has some fantastic uh, group rides as well that you can hit. So Juan, I hope that this information helps you. Uh, I think there's a lot of information that you can choose from, but it sort of depends on your ability level. Some of these are no drop rides and some of them are race rides. So it kind of depends on what you're looking for. But I would say start with the fast ones and then just sort of see where you stand among them. And if they're really easy for you, they're, then you're at the top of the heap. If you're getting dropped, I would say, you know, most rides have like an A version, a B version, sometimes even a C version. Sort of slot yourself with that and then go from there. All right. Thanks, Juan. Next up, what do we have, Adam? We have another email, uh, a listener email from Luke the Mailman. Hey, Brian, I'm enjoying the updated podcast. You asked for pics for, uh, from the tour. My postal route is par- partially on the tour route in San Antonio Heights, which is just above Upland. Here are some pics I took. All right. And he took some great pics. He actually sent in some ones that he took on the road which is great. Uh, It looks like when he took them, the Peloton was mostly intact. Beautiful day, great day for a bike race on the side of the road. The pack's coming through. It looks like uh, he took them during a flatter portion of the stage. It's a little bit strung out. But Luke, the mailman, uh, first of all, thank you for delivering the mail. (laughs) Second, you're a hero. (laughs) I wonder if you're a fan of the Postal Service team from from the Lance days. Secondly, those picks are great. Um, again, it's great to see people on the road taking pictures, having the race sort of come to them. I don't know how it's inspired people, but you know, it is something that uh, people need to see in person. I mean, it is one thing seeing it on TV, which is great because you get you know the helicopter footage and you get the on the bike camera footage, but actually seeing it there, watching them speed by and you going, wow, I didn't know bikes could go that fast. It's really cool. So I appreciate it. Luke, the mailman, keep it up. Keep writing in. All right, Adam, what's next? Okay. We have a comment from a YouTube viewer. I, this was on your video, which one on your, yeah. So this one was on the dirty Kansas video that I put out. So I was in Kansas, covered that event my first time in kansas and really my first not my first time covering gravel events but my first time covering a gravel event this big i just sort of put together some random video and then i put a youtube video up there and it and it i don't want to say got viral but it got pretty big it's up to about twenty five thousand views um and i pretty much videoed and documented sort of the pointy end the front end of the race So even though I was focused on maybe the top 10 cyclists, there were thousands of people that were in the race that I didn't document. Uh, And I don't want to take anything away from them because your effort, your effort in doing Dirty Kansas 200, 200 miles in the Kansas heat and the dirt and the mud and the rocks, and for the people that did the 100 and the 50 and the 25, uh, your accomplishment is not unnoticed. But at the same time, and maybe this is my own mistake, I focused only on sort of the pointy end of the race, but this person brings up a good point. Yeah, so I'm interested to hear your opinion on this. So this is from Byron, uh, Byron TGI Friday, um, and he, he made a, a video marker at the minute 16, 1639. It says, I'm sitting here watching these, these uh, world tour riders be featured on this video. I can't help think about the other... T- top 20 finishers, non-world tour or professional, who could dramatically benefit from being covered in these many different dirty cans of vlogs and YouTube videos. That is, professional cyclists taking away from the the spotlight from a lot of deserving non-professional riders who ended up in the top 20. Yes, it bugs me that the world tour guys are hogging the spotlight. To me, Dirty Cans is a homegrown grassroots event first. Yes, I'm being... commercial here and yes many may many people would not agree with my opinion and assessment and that's okay yeah um he brings up a good point and i think he's not the only one but the argument is he is saying that when the world tour writers are there it's taking away attention from the other people who are not on the world tour um 
there's a couple ways you can look at this, Byron. First of all, do you want Dirty Kansas to be inclusive? If you want it to be inclusive, then you need to say it's for everybody, including the very fast people. If you want it to be a little bit grassroots, homegrown, it's sad to say I think those days are over. I think the attention that, that Dirty Kansas gets and the media attention that it gets and that it's going to get in the future is only going to get bigger and bigger. I know you're probably a gravel purist, uh, which makes you say, well, yeah, these world tour guys, maybe they're hogging the spotlight. And they did because that was the focus of my videos. But I don't want to discount the fact that there were many other people in the race doing well. I wish I had an entire film crew with me to document uh, past the top 20, maybe the top 50 and really show them. I mean, these are people that don't get paid to ride a bike. They have full-time jobs. They are taking time out of their work schedule to come to Kansas to do this. And they're competing against people who do it for a full-time job and finishing pretty close to their finishing time. Uh, I will say, though, that the winner, Colin Strickland, is not a world tour writer. He's a U.S.-based writer, and he shocked everybody with a breakaway with basically 100 miles to go and nobody caught him. And he was the first writer to break 10 hours for the event. So I don't know. I, I think I get what you're saying, but at the same time, if you've ever watched, and somebody brought this up to me, I, I forget who and when, but if you ever watched a marathon race and you have all the people that participate in the marathon, whether it's the LA marathon, I know Boston, you have to qualify for Chicago, you know, the big ones, even the San Diego one, are the people in the marathon complaining that there are the elite runners from Kenya and Ethiopia and all over the world. I don't think they're complaining about that. I think if anything, they're going, oh, that's so cool. They're in the race. And maybe they even get to compare their time with a world class time. Uh, I don't think anyone's saying, no, they shouldn't be here. We need to keep marathons, grassroots. Maybe a few people. I think Dirty Kanza is one of those gravel events where, while it used to be grassroots, it's a well-known thing now, and it's the biggest gravel event in the world, so why not bring the biggest and best riders in the world? Adam, what do you, I mean, you're, you're kind of an outsider. What do you think? Should it be, should uh, it be grassroots or not? I think I see both sides, but I'm, I'm more of a townie, right? Yeah. <laughs> so I would probably say, yeah, you know, the big guys coming in does take away the spotlight, but, I, you know, I'm not, I don't have anything vested in it, but it's, if you want, I don't know, do they want this event to grow? Is it, or is well, it something that's already huge? It's already huge because in order to participate in Dirty Kanza, it's a lottery system now. So you'll put in for an entry and it's based up, up upon a lottery system, whether you get selected to do it, because they have a limited amount of spots. Mm. I, there's a, there's another one, the Dirty Kanza XL, which is 350 miles they only invited 80 people to do that because you have to apply mm -hmm. to actually do that so for this one is it limiting the amount of people that can come in that, from, that's, that's from the local people? right that's part of the argument so yeah. if a pro is like oh i've done the tour de france and now i want to do dirty kanza the amount of media attention the amount of fan attention that brings in is huge but you could argue maybe that takes the spot away from somebody who's building their entire year around this one mm -hmm. event. Um, I will say, though, <laughs> that the World Tour riders did not win. Yeah. And, and the World Tour riders that finished, they didn't sort of spike the football and was like, in your mm -hmm. face, losers. I mean, they were humbled by mm -hmm. it. They were exhausted. I mean, it shows they're human. They were cramping up with the best of them. And, and it was cool to see just what a world-class rider could do at an event like this so i don't know are you going next year i yes i i have to go maybe back you, next year. maybe next year you just focus on something else instead of the yeah really i just, mean so like do a video just on yeah the, i mean highlights them a little bit and then do a video on yeah that could be an option i'm people. sure there were and it's funny because there's enough dirty kansas videos where people were doing their own personal vlogs mm -hmm. 
and saying, here I am in the race. I mean, it's such a long day. I mean, people are taking 17, 18, 19 hours to finish, finishing in the dark. They have their cell phones with them. They're taking selfies. I mean, they're on course. You know, sometimes people are taking naps on the side of the road because they're so <laughs> exhausted. So it is one of those things that um, it will continue to grow. Um, maybe they will allow more people to do it. Uh, but at the same time, I get this guy's point. But I will say that uh, a lot of people were excited to see the World Tour guys doing it. In terms of hogging the spotlight, your, his words, may, maybe they were a little bit. But um, I think it's a deserved thing. I think, you know, they bring with that a certain amount of, uh, you know, if, if you're playing your local, your local community softball game, and a rod shows up wouldn't you want him just to see how you do or would you yeah, be like yeah. no you can't yeah go sit yeah, in the dugout <laughs> but it is cool to kind of kind of see how these people do on the home roads okay so that's it for listener feedback if you'd like to reach out to me hit me up brian at veloworthy.com uh, or dm on instagram or message on facebook and again i want to keep this segment going we would love to hear your questions all of these questions brought up some great points. So go ahead and hit us up on that. We'll be right back after these messages. If you're looking for a Grand Fondo that is both challenging as well as beautiful, check out the Mammoth Grand Fondo. It is one of the oldest running Grand Fondos at 26 years running, and it has also made Bicycling Magazine's top 10 centuries for its draw dropping vistas. It has 75 miles that is completely closed to traffic, not to mention at the end, there are awards for the fastest male finisher, fastest female, as well as fastest team finisher. You have three fantastic options to choose from. At 102 miles, for you super strong people out there, 70 miles, as well as 42 miles. Each participant is given a great pair of event socks, free professional event photos, and not to mention a post-ride meal plus music in the village at Mammoth. And my personal favorite, you get a beer to go with that as well. Check them out at mammothgrandfondo.com or on Facebook at Mammoth Grand Fondo. I just spent some time in Spain and Andorra, and it wasn't a vacation. It was actually work, and work in a good way. Uh, You've, if you've been paying attention to my social media, basically what was happening is I was working with Velo News and Scratch Labs covering the EF Education First training camp. We started off in Andorra, and then we also finished in Girona, Spain, which is home base for many English-speaking professional cyclists. This is a huge opportunity, and I went ahead and took it. Uh, I worked every single day working on audio with a, an amazing crew of uh, videographers, photographers. There was the Velo News producer, and we put together some great content, which is going to be coming out on velonews.com, which you can check out. Unfortunately, I can't share any of that on VeloWorthy due to an exclusivity clause that Velo news wanted and paid for. So I can't have any of the podcast or any type of audio from the trip on my channels, but I certainly can talk about how you can find it on Velo News. So basically what we were doing is we were capturing content from the EF training camp. It was broken up into sort of three different things. The first thing was in Andorra, in the Pyrenees mountains, we were working with TJ Van Garderen, Simon Clark, uh, Mike Woods, and then Tim Johnson, who was pacing these guys up an e-bike, and then we were covering that. It's sort of unprecedented because using an e-bike in the mountains had never been done before. And normally these riders are used to being paced by a scooter, but at the speeds and, and gradients of these climbs, a scooter is not efficient because you're either on the throttle and you're surging, or you're not on the throttle enough and the riders are passing you. So uh, the brainchild behind this whole project, Alan Lim, uh, is the one who came up with this idea of you get maybe an ex-pro like Tim Johnson, one of the world's best bike handlers. He's a four-time national cyclocross champion, former pro on the road. You put him on an e-bike and you have him pacing up people up these steep climbs. 
and it worked. It worked great. And hopefully those will show dividends during the Tour de France. The other thing that we covered was the EF team time trial practice for stage two, which already happened. Uh, we covered how they do rotations and they work together as a team, also the staff. And it worked well because EF uh, finished sixth, only 28 seconds off the pace of the winning team, Lotto, Lotto Jumbo. And uh, it was cool to kind of see that. And then the third thing was the training camps in Girona. And we climbed outside of Girona, hitting these big, big climbs, Olat and then Roca Corbo, which is this sort of infamous climb just outside. It takes the pros about a half an hour to do. And it was really cool. So sort of coming back and digesting all of this trip, knowing that I can't share any of it on VeloWorthy, I can only sort of talk about it. I can't share any of the audio content. I can only point you to velonews.com. Um, it's kind of an interesting thing. Um, so I don't know. I kind of really like the experience. It was my first time doing it and my first time sort of stepping off my VeloWorthy platform working for another brand. Yeah, so you, you and I, I, we both got back from Europe, I think, on the same day, and we had a chance to kind of talk about this. Mm -hmm. And I had a lot of questions right away because for me it's interesting. I see what you do here at your house, and I see how you, know, you have your own system put in place. And so like, one of my first questions was, and we know Velo News is like the, one of the biggest bicycling pub publications there is, what was it like to work with a team that's, in a sense, I, I'm sure they're semi-professional, right? I mean, not, are they are the professionals that are doing all this stuff and work for a huge publication. What was it like working for them? So, or working with them? Yeah, it's like I can think of a. Are they my boss? <laughs> are we are we colleagues? How how do we look at it? And let me tell you, it's it's a really interesting experience because. I was, you know, working with a team and with that team, we had to sit down every day, debrief and brief and go over Google sheets of content and what we're going to hit that day and what writers we're going to interview and talk to. So it was much more laid out and much more organized than just if one person were to do it. So first of all, the team included myself. I was in charge of audio and the podcasting portion both recording it and producing it and also acting as co-host on a couple of the podcasts for Velo News. Uh, the next person was Alan Lim, who was the orchestrator of this entire camp. Uh, it was, he's the coach of TJ Van Garderen, one of the Americans, and he wanted to bring TJ up to the level of suffering in the mountains, but doing it in a controlled environment. So we were documenting his coaching tactics his nurturing skills, the rice cakes, the ice, the hydration, all that stuff. The other person on the team was Sammy Sari. She's a she's one hell of a videographer. So if you've ever seen the Thereabouts movies with Lachlan Morton and Angus Morton, she's the one that shot those, documented it. She's a professional cyclist as well. She's a fixed gear rider, has done the Red Bull fixed gear Red Hook series. Um, and she's also a bike adventurer. She's also a local to Barcelona and lives in Girona. So she was sort of our local with the language barrier. Um, she knows Girona like the back of her hand, which is a great city. Um, and then she knows obviously how to get around Spain and Andorra because she's been there. She's from there. Uh, Greg Irwin was the photographer and he's a literal rock star. He is an amazing photographer. Check his photos out, Greg Irwin photo on Instagram. But little known fact, he's the drummer for the band Saint Motel, which their their record has already gone gold. Their Saint Motel album, they're coming out with another one, uh, and he's the drummer. And if you if you Google search Saint Motel drummer, there's tons of footage out there, uh, and he is a great person to be with. He is definitely. Uh, a great photographer, and he just brings this energy to the team. And then, of course, the adult of the team is Ben Delaney. Ben Delaney, you might know from Bike Radar and Cycling Tips and Velo News. Um, he was sort of in charge of orchestrating, producing, and bringing all this content together, which is being released at a regular interval during the Tour de France. So that was our team, and that's who we worked with. And then our team went and sort of captured 
all that was going on with the EF team. And so working with them, it brings a level of professionalism up because let me tell you something, I stayed with them in an apartment in Girona. And after we're done with the day in being in the cars, following with the riders, they all got on the computers. And if you're the one standing around, you don't want to be that person. You want to be contributing to that group. And it really motivates you to uh, be your best self in terms of, hey, they saw a skill that I have in podcasting. They saw some value in it. They wanted to bring me on and I kind of didn't want to disappoint them. And that was super key. So that's kind of the the atmosphere. That being said, (laughs) (laughs) that being said, there was definitely fun times. I mean, we went out, we went out at night, we went, we got a day where we got to ride bikes. So as professional as they are, it wasn't like a corporate atmosphere. I mean, there was a heat wave throughout Europe and we were just lounging in the pool. But you work for yourself. I mean, you've done this now for three years, right? You've worked for yourself. Did you feel like the consequences of any mistakes would be magnified tenfold compared to what you're used to? Like, I, for me, I can just imagine working for a big organization like this and then you, you're having to produce stuff for them now that the consequences of a, of a mistake are, are much higher. Right. So that's a good point. Do you feel stressed out? In yeah. Did it, did it stress me out? Yeah. Yes, it did. I had pre-planned this entire trip. I had to get new equipment. I got wireless microphones. Um, I bought extra of everything. There's a saying in the military, two is one and one is none, which means that you better have a backup. And I had backups of just about everything. I had battery backups, cable backups, universal plugs for Europe. I had, I brought in at least a dozen extra batteries. Um, So plan for every kind of contingency you can think of. Because the worst case scenario is if they're capturing some great content and there's no sound, there's only one person they could point at, and that's me. And if that, and there's no take two. I mean, these writers, you're often at the whim of their schedule. And you're schedule. out in the mountains somewhere, right? You can't just run back to the hotel and get the equipment. Exactly. We're out in the mountains. I mean, I bought a special backpack that had all the gear. <laughs> we were, there were two cars. There was a lead car and a follow car. We were in the follow car, and in that car we had not only our own gear, but we had stuff for the riders. We had ice and drinks and food, and if they needed something, they relied on us to get it. And on top of that, we're the crew that documented everything. So it was super important that you don't make a mistake. You don't screw up. And there were a little bit of screw-ups. I I don't want to say screw-ups, but just... Things, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty. Looking back, you can say, oh, we could have done this or that better, which makes you a better person. So to say, oh, there was, it was perfect and it was flawless, that's a lie. I mean, I wanted to do a good job for Velo News and I wanted to do a good job for Scratch Labs and I think I did. Um, they were impressed with some of the know-how and the skills I had when it came to the sound department. But, you know, it, it's a learning experience for me because I've never done it before. But I just had to make sure that I knew what I was doing and I presented them with skills that they could rely on, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. So, I so well, one of the other questions I had when we, when we first talked was, what was a typical day like? Like, so I'm imagining I, I was in Europe at the same time. It was blazing hot. Um, and in Spain, I seemed like I bet it was even hotter. So what, what was your typical day like? Run us through when you'd get up and what time you'd go to bed and what did you do in between? So first of all, there was a heat wave across Europe, especially in Spain. There were multiple days where it was over 100 degrees. The only air conditioning we got was in the car. A lot of places in Spain it does not have traditional or modern day air conditioning. We're in traditional buildings which is fine because we were put up in a great place with a swimming pool and ceiling fans. But basically the typical day was a I'm up super early or up late at night. What's super early? Well, I'm I'm still jet lagged and it took me (laughs) by the last day I'm over the jet lag. Then I head back home. Then I have jet lag at home. So I'm up during the worst hours, but we pretty much landed in Barcelona we drove straight from Barcelona, myself, Greg, and Ben Delaney from Velo News. We drove straight from Barcelona to Andorra, 
which is its own principality. It's up in the mountains, so it's a little bit cooler. And then we got there around 11, 12 at night. And then in that morning, we hit the ground running. So each day worked like this. We got all our gear, made sure everything was charged, packed it all up in the bags, cleared out our inner memory cards that we had because we needed to make space. And then we would drive to the location of the cyclists, meet with them, go over the route for the day, the intended goal or um, objective. And then as soon as the riders are off, we're following with them. And when we're following, we're not only documenting, but we have all the supplies, gear, you know, bike pumps, stuff like that. So it left as little for the riders to think and do as possible other than ride. So these rides are long. They're five, six hours. So we get back, you know, we leave at maybe wake up 6 a.m., leave the apartment 7, 7.30, try and get some coffee, which you had to order multiples of because the sizes of the coffees in Europe are teeny tiny. You know, you order an Americano. Tastes great when you have like five of them. Yeah. Then when we're on the road, we don't have time to really stop and eat lunch. You have to pack whatever stuff. So any thought of going to like a nice, cultured, experienced a Spanish tapas place that goes out the window. You're on Pringles and chips and water and whatever you can get from a convenience store. Then when we come back and all that footage is captured, you kind of decompress because it is stressful following cyclists through the Pyrenees and switchback mountains. You're kind of car sick. I got car sick because we're going so fast uh, through the routes because we're, you know, bikes can descend faster on the downhills than cars can and you're screeching tires around by the time we get back first thing we do is we're just kind of oh my gosh we need to offload all the content that we gathered so i'm dumping memory cards into my computer onto a hard drive sending that to ben ben's going over that we're editing some stuff he's sending that off to velo news because everything's on a deadline a very strict and tight deadline by the time that happens, we're working uh, till about dinner time, which is in Spain, about eight, nine o'clock at night. Then we usually walk to a location. And again, we're in downtown Girona. Uh, Alan and Sammy know everything about downtown Girona. We're walking around. He's like, oh, that's Lance Armstrong's former apartment. This is where George Hincapie used to live. And uh, we're walking through these areas. And then you just walk to a restaurant sit down and that's where we really have time to sort of go over the day what we did Uh, we eat for about two hours it's well late into the night get back home about 11 p.m Uh, that gives us any time to get on any social media make any necessary phone calls or texts home because that's usually the time people back in the states are awake and then try and get some sleep and then start the process all over again so that's basically a typical day uh, during this trip. And why did it, ha- my, my, one of the questions I had was, why did it have to be so rushed? And then you, you, you kind of explained to me that there are deadlines that have to be met with social media. And that was, to me, was interesting because, you know, when you, you do in your own podcast, there's, you know, more leeway time and things. But right. you have, with the big organization like Velo News, you have people waiting for the content to get there so that it can be published and put out on social media and stuff. Yeah. So, I mean, that was one of the things. I mean, and it was work and I was getting paid to do it. And what it does for my brand, it it's probably open doors to see that, you know, they did mention Velo Worthy in, in the podcast and on their website, which is cool because I am definitely David and Velo News is definitely Goliath. And it is one of those things where you're like, wow, this could this could really work wonders. And and it is, and it's great because I'm able to get access to a side of cycling I normally watch on TV. And I'm able to hang out and chat with the writers that, again, you normally just read about. And it's cool because after a while, after you spend a certain amount of days with guys like TJ Van Garderen, you just talk about normal stuff. Yeah, and, well, one of the things that was interesting to me is, we're, this is you know a week ago, you were, or two weeks ago, you were gonna see, you're working with these guys that are going to be in the tour two weeks from when you were filming, right? So mm-hmm. 
What was that like working with these guys that you know in two weeks are going to be suffering and doing you know the, the most rigorous race, bicycling race in the world? Yeah, so I, I tried to keep my distance at first. You know, you don't want to talk their ear off. I mean, they're at work. You know, they're riding their bike five hours a day. The last thing they want to do is talk to you. But then after a while, it's just us. It's like the five of us and then two or three of them. And we're in the middle of nowhere and you just start talking. So one instance, like I was uh, recording TJ, I had, I had my mic up to him and he looks at me and he noticed that I had some road rash on my leg and he's like, oh, did you go down? Like he knew he could tell just from that. And I'm like, oh yeah, I was on a gravel ride back home in SoCal and uh, I went down, I tried to jump a curb and scraped it up and he's like, oh man, that sucks. So you kind of just talk to them like a normal person because they are normal, but they can do extraordinary things. The other thing that was cool was when we were with the EF team time trial camp, you got to see the entire team, the entire staff. Uh, I got to meet a lot of the directors and coaches. And one cool thing was like, uh, his name's Tim. He's the team doctor and American for EF. He looked at my leg. He's like, Hey, let me give you some bandages and tagaderm for that. I mean, that's his bread and butter. So he, did he do a better job than you could have no, done. Definitely. <laughs> he definitely did wrap me up. I was like, Oh my gosh, here's a team doctor for somebody that for teams and writers that are world-class. And then here's me, the sound guy. And he's like, <laughs> he's wrapping me up. So I thought that was really cool. What was it like seeing the infrastructure of the team at work? Right. Cause we hear about it, but we just don't know what it's actually like. It was very, very professional. So again, these are people that are going to be working together for the tour de France, the staff. So we're talking mechanics, soigneurs, um, the directors, the media people. We even met the chef, team chef, and they have to work like a well-oiled machine. They're all wearing uniforms, driving team cars. Um, you know, there's a little bit of talking with a press officer saying, well, you can shoot this bike, but you can't post about it until this date because that's when we're unveiling this new Cannondale uh, Super 6, which is already out now. But when we were there, they had to sort of put an embargo on that. And to, you know, it sounds kind of petty, but to them, it's a company that wants to control the narrative of when they're releasing mm -hmm. certain things. And if I mistakenly posted about that, I'd have a lot to answer for. So you're definitely, it's much more serious of an environment, I think. It's much more formal. And when you're there, you just sort of tread lightly. You try not to get in people's way. Uh, and you're just there to document. You're not there to have a sit down chat with Rigoberto Uran and talk about his life. You're there to take pictures and, and, and capture a content. Job to do. Yeah. Yeah. And everybody had a job to do, including myself. So we all had a role there. Yeah. And that, that was super key. So what do you if you could lump it down into maybe one or two things each, what were the best and worst worst parts of the trip? I would say you? honestly the best parts of the trip was my ability to see these riders in an environment that few people get to see. And that is them training. And if you're a cyclist and you're listening to this, you all go out there and train and you mostly train alone, not counting the group ride or the race. But to see these guys empty themselves and you're going, wow, there's only a few people in the world that can keep up with them and beat them. And, and we're in the follow car and I'm hanging out the window, staring at them, looking at their form, going, oh my gosh, it's 103 degrees out and they're just totally putting money in the bank for the tour. That was cool. And, and also going like, there's only a few of us here and, and that's who, and that's, we, it's hard to share that, you know, uh, I would say that's the best part. And knowing that these writers, when I see them on TV, I'll have some very tiny, small part going, Hey, I help them get to that point, even though they have a whole team of people behind them helping them get to that point with athlete, doctors and coaches and physiologists and nutritionists and things like that. I'd say the worst part was just the workload. I wasn't used to it. Um, and I'm not complaining. I'm just saying that I'm not used to putting in those long a days and nights and sort of going, I want to put my best foot forward. I, I'm stressed. The stress is on myself. I don't want to burn myself out. I mean, these are people that have been doing this for a long time. These are people that are professionals. You have a professional videographer, 
you know, for Vela News reporter. And of course, Ellen does this all the time. So you just step up your game. And the worst part was that stress that I put on myself saying, okay, I want to do a good job for them. Even though I, it has nothing really to do with my own brand, they are putting their trust in my skills. So that stress maybe manifested itself to me not getting enough sleep or something so like that. So what do you think you can apply from that trip to your own podcast? A lot. <laughs> God. Coming back home and saying, how am I going to apply this to my own po podcast? There's so many little things that I learned on that trip in order, of, in order of, you know, in terms of efficiency, in terms of meeting a deadline, in terms of being efficient with the equipment that I have. Um, I'm definitely applying that to my own podcast. And I think, you know, if I had to do this all over again, I would definitely do it. And I, and I think that, um, it does speak to the brand that I got their attention. And, you know, I mean, I have traveled to the tour de France before, but I haven't worked in this capacity. I've done other events like tour of California, which are smaller in scale, but, uh, I know that I'm not a sound engineer. <laughs> <laughs> I know that I am not a producer, like I'm a podcaster, but when it came time for me to do those tasks, I did it. Yeah. And that's what counts. And I, who knows next year, maybe I'll do it again. Maybe I'll cover training camp with EF again, and I'll run it even smoother. Um, there's that whole, you have a lot of time on the plane ride back. It's like a 13 hour plane ride to think, what did I just do? What just happened? Who's going to listen to this? How many people is this going to reach? And then when you're watching the tour on TV, you're like, I know that guy. Like we're, we were saying, talking some pretty foul jokes to each other just a couple of weeks before. And now they're at the tour de France. So that kind of brings a human element to the whole thing. So that's really cool. I would totally do it again. Next time I do it, I'm going to be a little bit more prepared in that respect. And I think that my skills can shine on any stage, whether it's my own platform, Velo News, or any other media outlet. I really think that my skills can apply just about anywhere. So that is our show. Uh, check out velonews.com for all the content that we put together. Like I said, unfortunately, I can't share it on Velo Worthy, but you can go ahead and check out the pictures that we put up on Instagram. That's at Velo Worthy. Of course, check out our links that we put up to some of the documentaries on Facebook. And then, of course, don't forget the 10-day window starts now for the LEL Velo Worthy Cycling Kit. Links for everything will be on all the socials as well as the website veloworthy.com. If you have questions about any of the fit or anything like that, go ahead and feel free to email me, brian at veloworthy.com. I'll try and answer your questions as best I can, but really lelcycling.com has all the resources you need in terms of uh, the fit, the look, uh, that sort of thing when it comes to the jersey as well as the bib and of course the speed suit. So until next time, this is Brian Coe for Adam Saba saying stay veloworthy.